Um, hi, I'm Takashi. Um, so I've been working for Suze Fairway for a long time, and still I'm working for the kernel stuff. And this year again, uh, my talk is about the kernel. Um, so this is the outline of my talk today. So at first, I, I will start something clarifying meters and followed by the what's new in the Leap 15.1 kernel, and then going to the um, SUSE or OpenSUSE kernel development process. And that's something to show how the things get fixed and how the things get tested. So the uh, first topic is about the clarifying meters. That means uh, just kind of FAQ about uh, our kernel. And here's my talk about, it's about um, OpenSUSE Leap and SUSE Linux Enterprise. And the, one of the common question is, um, well, Leap, Leap and SD kernels, they're same, identical? Well, it's yes and no. Um, yes, the both packages are built from the very source, uh, same source tree. However, um, SD kernel and deep kernel, they have major differences in the binary form. And first of all, the kernel configurations, they are completely different between two. Um, the um, SUSE Linux Enterprise kernel have reduced kernel configuration while OpenSUSE Deep contains almost full uh, enablement of the all features. And SD kernel has a split for um, two packages. One is a supported, another is unsupported modules. And while Deep has only one kernel package, contains everything. And both packages are built in different environments, build, build, build services, IBS, internal build service, versus OBS, OpenSUSE build service. And then Slay kernel uh, supports um, live patching by KGraph, while SUSE, OpenSUSE Leap doesn't provide that yet. So also the same, uh, they are built from the very same, uh, same source tree. The resultant binary packages are completely different. And um, maybe that is a most commonly asked or seen thing that OpenSUSE D15051, uh, 14, uh, for the 12 kernel that is very, very, very old. Yeah, yes, it's old. And actually, our, looking at our history, um, uh, OpenSUSE Deep takes relatively old kernel bases. So OpenSUSE D42 uh, take, uh, took a 4.4 four four kernel basis, and OpenSUSE Leap 15.0 and 1 are based on 4.12 kernel. That's correct. However, we took really huge amount of patches on top of that. And now, uh, well, OpenSUSE Leap 15.0, we already took 22,000 patches on top. Now, guess what, for 51. Ah, 46,000. So almost 50,000 patches on top. And that's why it, it is no longer for the 12 kernel. It is a kind of question of the shape of the cells. That's a famous um, soft experiment. So this is no longer original for the 12, but quite, yeah, containing so much different components on top. And is it deep? Is the kernel stable? In that case, the answer is yes. So actually, this is the reason, the very much reason why we take that old kernel code base. And that's another point of the, about the stability is that we guarantee, as a kind of guarantee, to provide a cons and consistent kernel ABI. That means if you build a kernel module package once, then this, is, this package can be built for all kernels after upgrades, updates of the, the same version. And we do proactive 
fix back, uh, backporting fixes, and also that are from the several trusted sources. And we do uh, CI and QA testing regularly on the kernel. So let's continue to the next thing, that's what's new in Deep51. So as I said, there are so many changes in the kernel in Deep51. And um, this is a table showing the how, so which directories, top directories in the kernel contain the changes. And as you can see, that majority of changes have, be, have been done to the drivers. This astonishing over 86% of the source code changes. So um, we, in the end, we almost had uh, 5 million lines of changes, and yeah, about that 86%. And that, this is not surprising, because um, in general, drive, device drivers are uh, that tend to have a um, well, bunch of changes in the code, while the important changes like the uh, memory management core or file system, their changes, amount of changes are short, so small. However, they are important. And for deep and SD kernels, we are kind of conservative. So we don't touch too much about the core part intensively, while we are backporting many things to uh, support the new features of the new machines or new systems. That's the re re uh, one of the reasons that we get this uh, statistics. So now 51. Um, so let's start from the server side. We had, um, as you can guess, many, many storage and file system block layer and network updates. Uh, most of SCSI, so recent SCSI drivers have been updated, and um, <coughs> InfiniBunch, RVDMA, and uh, in one another interesting thing is uh, NVMe over fabrics that is required for net app stuff, and we catch up upstream. And file, st file system got also a bunch of updates, especially ButterFS. This is uh, our the default file system, and also XFS, XT4. And at this time, we got a bunch of B cache updates, and MD RAID, and CF and CIFS, and block layer. Um, that now we are still, I think we still didn't switch default to multi queue, but we got the update to the most recent code for the um, block memory queue, and that includes a BFQ uh, IO scheduler. And network, yeah, of course, the network core has been updated, and Ethernet, yeah, Broadcom, Cabium, Chelsea, Cisco, oh, well, you name it, most of the um, vendors have been updated. The desktop usage, um, the first of all, that is video driver, DRM, DRM stack updates, that we raise the whole code up to 4.19 or later stage. And actually, this is a very much many, many changes. And this is about 20% of the whole 50,000 lines of changes. And also, Wi Fi drivers, we almost uh, we update almost the whole Wi Fi drivers and Wi Fi stack up to 4.19 plus and storage, MMC, SD, and they are, have been updated. And sound drivers, that's my area, and uh, so I update, upgraded whole HD audio, USB audio to 5.0 or even 5.1. Um, then bus platforms, etc. We got a Thunderbolt update, PCI hot plug, and FGPA small bitch still, and TPM 1.2 to 0 things and. Uh, uh, RDT memory band ad, uh, bandwidth allocation stuff, also hardware, crypto, and x86, HWMI, uh, WMI. This is uh, for laptops and desktops. And virtual machines, KVM, Hyper-V, Zen, they have been upgraded. And security, up armor. And another interesting thing is AMD SEV, that is a uh, um, secure encrypted virtual machine. I forgot the uh, anonym. <coughs> 
and tools as a perf and BBF. Of course, these stuff have been updated. And architectures. And for the x86, um, we add support for the recent new, uh, new recent Intel and AMD chipsets, like uh, I forgot the name, Whiskey, Whiskey Lake, Amber Lake, or um, Libich, also Ice Lake, and also, also AMD Ryzen Zen 2 thing. Oh, well, Zen 2 is uh, just Libich. And ARM64, oh, well, there are, we, there are so many changes, and I cannot list up. So if you, if you have a question, here is a Matthias Brugge, then he can, he can answer. Yeah. Or uh, something's broken that it's, <laughs> it's because his updates. And ARM's uh, 30 pitch. For that, we didn't have much updates, so much backports. But only casual fixes that are spotted, uh, spotted uh, from the uh, trusted stable tree or fixes. And ARM 32 bit is provided only for Leap. This is not for uh, Suzy Linux Enterprise. And on the other hand, PowerPC 64 and S319, they are mostly for Suzy Linux Enterprise, and they, are, they got also updates. Also, um, we provide, I think we provide um, the, these architectures package also for ports on OpenSUSE Leap. So continue on SUSE Linux uh, kernel development, how that happens. So not surprisingly, we manage that in Git. Yes, of course, everything is on the Git. And what, different, what is different in um, SUSE, OpenSUSE, kernel ma source management from other distribution is that uh, we keep all code changes in individual patches instead of applying the patch on the git kernel tree. Instead, git kernel repository contains patches, patch, 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 patch files. And this is applied on dynamically at the building package, a la, so just like a couch, and this uh, series.conf contains a list of patches, so which patches applied first and next, so on. And the repository contains a patch files. Um, when, you do, when you look at the kernel source packages, uh, you can find that over 97% of patches are from upstream. So I mean, this means upstream industry. And that is the result we really try hard to push upstream first rule. So we basically accept only patches that are upstream or that will be upstreamed. And the, the recent changes in the development process is that well, we apply sorted patches. And what is sorted patches? Um, that means basically we apply the patches in order, the same order like um, upstream tree. So suppose that upstream industry had uh, changes A, B, C. And then we applied patches A, B, and C, that order. That's all. That is a sorted patches. Um, that means we, uh, for example, when we had the patch B and C first applied, and we found out that the patch A is missing, then we, up, we have to apply patch A. And in that case, we don't apply patch B, C, A. Instead, we apply patch A, B, and C. So for that, always reordering the patches to up adapt the upstream, the topological order. So that is the key of the sorted patches. And why we do that? <coughs> because by keeping the sorted order, the each patch is, becomes closer to the original form. And this has a big merit that um, that makes the backport easier, backport cleaner. And also, it makes it easier to catch any backport mistakes. You can just compare the patch, the backported patch, patch and the original commit. 
So the, um, how to expand patches? Uh, yeah, we have uh, 50,000 patches, as I said, and this may take really long time. Um, if you run Kilch script for these 50,000 patches, I measure that, and that takes six hours on this machine. Um, six hours patch up time, it's not good for the daily job. Uh, morning up any patches, then sleeping, the day's over. <laughs> it's a good job. <laughs> so that, that can be actually faster. Um, so we had already a script, so-called a sequence patch, and that applies the patches, and just like huge, but a bit, yeah, uh, optimized way. And this takes nine minutes, 25 minutes for 50,000 patches. It's faster, yeah, but still take time. But there is a trick. The script got um, fast mode. And what does mode do? Um, the problem of the previous approach was that um, script invokes patch program at each time. That means 50,000 times patch was invoked. So patch program executed. That took so, much, so many time. So instead, this mode, we gather all 50,000 patches in a single patch file and feeds to a patch program. Then that works. Then that's 80 seconds. Good. However, the drawback of that, this approach is that you cannot roll back to the um, patch that fails to apply. Um, is there any better way? Yeah, there is. The recent three, uh, Michael Sup developed a program called Rapid Coach. And this is a program written by Rust and that applies the patches in parallel and also supports the rollback at the fa patch failure. And um, if you use that program on my machine, that's with an uh, eight-core machine, it takes only three seconds for 5,000 apply, uh, applying 5,000 pa patches instead of six hours. That's really awesome. Um, then Suze Kernel Git tree. This is publicly available and you can see that kernel.suze.com at any time. And this Git tree contains several different branches, and each branch, uh, mostly, yeah, each branch represents uh, for the, um, each, so to say, the product, like uh, uh, SLA 15, what well, SLA 15 SP1, OpenSUSE 15.0, OpenSUSE 51, and also Tumbleweed is taken from the stable branch. That's, that's tracks to the uh, stable, uh, upstream stable kernel. Also, there is a master and the head. This uh, tracking the Linux tree. That's currently 5.2 RC1. And also, there is a vanilla and Linux next branches that uh, automatically fetch the Git tree from the upstream. And just, just for that, these are all just for testing. And Git workflow. And that's we do, yeah, kind of GitHub-like or a normal Git workflow. Just taking the each Git branch maintainer takes a, a pull request from the each developer and merge after integration test and review. That's the way. And there is a KBoot bot running um, that's testing the builds and also do, doing the sanity checks, like a, a patch can be applied cleanly or something, something wrong contained and so on. And if the, everything's okay, then KBit Bolt says that, yes, you, it's, this branch can be merged, and the branch means that reviews and merge that stuff. And one thing to be noted that is that branch, some branches are shared by other branches. For example, SLA 15 is shared by many other branches, and this, that branch is autom automatically merged to other branches. Uh, this is like, like that. So SLA branch is merged to SLA 12 SP4 and SLA 
15 SP1 and SS12 is even SP5. And SA15 is derived to uh, open system 15.0 and so on. Um, that's for users and developers. One good thing to know is kernel of the day. This is really I would recommend to remember. And actually, this is a kernel package built from the um, very latest kernel git branch. And in OBS, it's updated daily. So every day it's updated and fetch the very uh, latest git repository and rebuild the package. Um, that OBS kernel colon SLA15 or this kernel column branch that contains the kernel package, kernel of the day. So why this is good? So you can install kernel of the day package from other branches too. That means if you have a brand new laptop that OpenSUSE DP51 still doesn't support, then you can install OpenSUSE uh, Tumbleweed kernel and very latest one from the kernel stable tree. Or if you have a regression after upgrading to the OpenSUSE DP51, then you can just install the old OpenSUSE DP15.0 kernel on top of your 51 system and see whether it, uh, the problem gets fixed by that. And if yes, then it, this is a kernel regression of 51. Then you can report that. Then we see what change are done and so on. Um, one thing to be noted that you sh it's better to increase the number of multi-installable limits in zip.com file beforehand. And as a default, I think there are only you can install two or three kernels on the system. But usually I increase that number to five or six. So bug fixes. Um, so as I said, the deep or the in general open source uh, we apply the bug fixes on by our, our hands. And usually we take the bug fixes from the upstream commit. And how we can find that bug fix? Um, the, nowadays, the kernel developer is supposed to mark fixes tag if, there's some, the, bug, uh, if the commit is supposed to be a regression fix. Then, there is a uh, script or uh, program Git, uh, called Git Fixes. And this program can scan the upstream changes and reports which, uh, which commit may fix our, uh, the bug that's found in our kernel. And this is one way to find out the uh, fixes from the upstream. And another way is just looking at the stable kernel trees. And currently, there are 4.14 and 4.19 long time support kernel. And we, there, there is a script, also Git fix can take a look at that and see which path, which commits are missing, possibly fix the problem. And if we have a problem, then of course you can report SUSE or open SUSE bugs here. Or we can take a look at upstream bug trackers too. And now, the, some, the, this is something new. Um, now we have a lightweight CI tests for the kernel. And actually, this is running hourly on the Git uh, on my, my desktop, <laughs> currently not the cloud. And it fetches the Git commit. And if something changed, then running the te tests. And it tests only KVM and boot to T. Uh, to the desktop system and doing also uh, suspend regime testing. And there, there are different images built from the different file systems and also AFI legacy boots and different uh, QM graphics backends. And so that helps sometimes to catch their regression as early as possible. And another new thing is that we deploy OpenQA tests for the kernel of the day. So thanks to the QA team, there's, um, we, 
they take uh, certain branches, currently SA15, SA15, SA12, SP4, and something else, and they test kind of the day, so every day, basically. And that's OpenQA, so it's currently limited only on virtual machine. And the uh, test scenarios are seem, seem also limited. Uh, currently, they test only uh, LTP. So that's basically all my topics. Then resource, the account is .com and OBS repository is there. So if you, some, if you want to find something, then you can take a look at that. OK. So that's all. Any questions or bashing to the kernel package or something else? <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, it's not not directly a question, but more like a comment. So I think as an open source community, we should think about how to. Um, how to manage, how to handle requests for OpenSUSE Leap kernel development because I think we, we use an OpenSUSE Leap, we use this Leap kernel, which I think makes a lot of sense because of the stability. But we sometimes had the problem that afterwards someone came and said, hey, this driver or this peripheral is not working, this is a bug. And we told him, no, you can't, we can't. Uh, at this driver now because it's already closed. So we, I think we would need to like formalize in some way uh, the possibility for the community to create feature requests against uh, Leap kernel to include their needs. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, very much. I agree that we used to have the uh, open page in the past, but it was discontinued. I think. So the current way to request for the OpenSUSE Deep is either Bugzilla, just op open the Bugzilla entry to report that, or ask on the OpenSUSE kernel mailing list or factory. Maybe the OpenSUSE kernel is better. But uh, yes, but it's, it will be better to have uh, some more formal way because uh, we want to track the feature request itself. Yeah, but I think this, yeah, leave it above my hands. <laughs> Good. Good, okay, thank you. Thank you for attention.